missing story in energy is the resurgence of resource nationalism. People increasingly through the, uh, see through the talk of a global commons of resources to mean the big powers claim other people's oil. State-owned companies now have an exclusive access to 77% of the world's proven conventional oil reserves. So that government-owned oil companies, uh, of course, they focus more on national than on global goals in, in, uh, as a, their, their uh, corporate strategy. Saudi Aramco, the National Iranian Oil Company, the Iraq National Oil Company, each control over 100 billion barrels of oil reserves. And they make the old seven sisters of oil, the big transnationals that dominated international oil for so long, look like Lilliputians. Exxon's reserves are left to 12 billion barrels compared to Saudi Aramco's 250, or at least that's what Saudi Arabia says it has, it probably has less. And I realize that Iraq's national oil company is at least somewhat in American hands. But um, although the um, the U.S. is the world's great empire. Americans talk a lot about independence. It's usually, it's usually uh, colonies or uh, satellites that talk about independence. Uh, but especially regarding energy. Uh, they tend to equate energy independence with national energy security. The Democratic Party in, uh, declared July the 4th Energy Independence Day. Well, ever since leading a war for independence against the British Empire, the great empire at the time, independence has been a U.S motif. Unfortunately, the U.S. has tended to not extend its own quest for national independence to other countries whose sovereignties they often puncture. Well, Canada and the United States are widely seen as having similar energy and environmental policies at the current, at the current time. Both countries leave control of oil and natural gas to corporations, private mm -hmm. corporations, support the projection of U.S. power abroad as guaranteeing free energy markets and do little to curb greenhouse gases. Yet their rhetorics diverge widely. All U.S. Presidents, presidents since Richard Nixon have promised Americans energy independence. Yet the, every year, the U.S. is less and less energy independent. In contrast, no prime minister since Trudeau uh, has talked about energy independence. Each have enth enthusiastically supported Canada's satellite role of helping to ensure U.S. energy security, which in fact undermines the energy security for Canadians. Because we're sending all of that oil there, we are not taking care of our own people. Um, living in a country where the dominant season is winter, energy security, of course, is a, a matter of survival for Canadians. The irony is that American presidents promise energy independence but fail to do much about it, while Canadian prime ministers do not talk about it but could easily achieve it. Canada, of course, exports more than we consume. And in the US, the choice is to go really green and substantially cut domestic fossil fuel consumption to domestic production levels, or use aggressive tactics, including war, to get other people's oil. Going green means independence, where in fact empire means dependence. And Canada's choices are the opposite. Canada must gain energy independence to go green or to continue to burn through what dwind its dwindling supplies of fossil fuels, be the greenhouse gases bad boy by guaranteeing high fossil fuel exports to the United States, and to be deputy sheriff to the U.S. in its oil ven uh, ventures abroad. You probably heard uh, Stephen Harper talk about Canada as an energy superpower, right? He says that to every foreign leader he can. Uh, uh, now, it's clear he hasn't consulted the dictionary. Superpowers influence events by projecting economic, military, political, and cultural power on a world scale. Does that sound like Canada? Well, the proportionality clause, which I'm going to go into, which is the mandatory exporting clause, makes Canada much more like an energy colony. Like, uh, and it's, of course, a place where people lose control over their own, their own resources. When you cannot safeguard your citizens against freezing in the dark, nor control how much you export, nor set the price at which citizens buy back their own energy from foreign uh, transnational corporations, you know you are not a superpower. Instead, Canadian energy policies are geared towards ensuring U.S. energy security. 
Now, does the world have an energy superpower? Yes, Russia. If anybody has an energy superpower, it's Russia. Second biggest producer of oil in the world and the greatest producer of natural gas. Um, it's kind of like Saudi Arabia with nukes and missiles. Um, well, I want to uh, shift to the triple threats um, that the world faces and, and to look at how we link these. Uh, the world faces three current challenges. Climate change catastrophe, the dwindling of supply of cheap fossil fuels, and energy insecurity. The, the, the inter energy insecurity, the threats to everyone having a home and being able to heat it, growing uh, local food, and, and have basic energy needs met from domestic resources. In Canada, we hear about from the first two camps, the, the peak oil camp and the climate change camp, um, but we don't hear very much about energy security. We do elsewhere. When I was at that conference in Trento, uh, Italy, all the European countries are very concerned about energy security. The Americans that were present were talking about that as well. Uh, the, the Russians who were there, the Turks, uh, you know, everybody except for Canadians. And I think energy security for Canada is a way to bridge the gap between the pickers and the climate stabilizers. Um, and conservation is the key to both. Um, we can cut, uh, uh, but the problem is that we can cut fossil fuel usage <coughs> substantially in Canada only if we have a Canada first energy policy. Um, the problem is now, if we started to cut consumption substantially, which we should be doing, the surplus that we save would be exported to the United States. And then it would be, we would then have to export even more. It would be mandatory for us to export at that increased level. And it's going to be very hard to convince Canadians to cycle and drive smart cars so uh, more Americans can drive SUVs and Hummers. Uh, so what we need to do is we need to bring together, we need to tie production and consumption in Canada together. So if Canadians cut uh, their, their usage of fossil fuels, the production of energy also falls because it's in the production of energy is the, the fastest growing source of greenhouse gases. Um, en energy uh, security is an interesting combination between Canadian economic nationalism, taking care of your own first. I, I was speaking to, uh, I actually uh, uh, had a phone call with Matt Simmons in uh, Houston. He's uh, one of the, of course, the uh, leading advocates of uh, peak oil. Uh, but he's also the, uh, the owner of the largest uh, uh, petroleum investment bank in the world. And in the first two minutes, he told me, that he had worked on uh, George, on uh, George Bush, Governor Bush's uh, campaign to be uh, uh, governor of, of Texas. Uh, so that that was where his post. But he said, he said, you know, he said, governments often don't take care of their own people well, but they certainly are not going to take care of someone else's people. <laughs> so if you don't can't take care of yourself, no one else is going to. Um, and, but so. It's a, it's a, this Canadian, it's an interesting combination of Canadian economic nationalism and being good internationalists, reducing greenhouse gases in Canada, and we are one of the worst in that, and conserving fossil fuels for humanity and for all life forms. Um, but Canada faces this obstacle of lack of energy security. Uh, okay, in the long term, strategic petroleum reserves help short-term crunches but not long-term ones. Unlike most countries, Canada has the potential to secure energy uh, su uh, supplies from the, in the medium to long term, but only if changes are made in policy direction. We have to turn around energy policy in Canada 180 degrees. Um, and we must uh, revert to policies we had before the free trade agreement of 1989. Um, the long-term policy was that we, uh, for natural gas, you were not allowed to export natural gas unless you had a 25-year supply, proven supply in Canada, before you could get an export license. Uh, I'm saying bring that back. And also uh, apply that to oil. Um, now, of course, we don't. I wouldn't like to see us get into uh, just uh, using um, dirty uh, oil from the tar sands, which is possible that the uh, 
the Americans would, um, it's possible that they will um, not import that oil. They, they, there is a move to uh, try and um, uh, keep the imports to uh, oil which has the same carbon uh, footprint as uh, conventional oil. So I wouldn't like to see us then taking up that oil to, to Eastern Canada just as a security thing. It's got to be tied into a green